something to say. Hello everyone, how are you doing today? My name's Charlie. You might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset, especially if you're reading my new book, Crucify My Love, or my sort of new book, which is The Chain. Yeah, that one. Um, it, it's over at the Wattpad with new chapters, a brand new chapter actually just went up yesterday. It's called The Dark Lord. And hopefully people will get the humor of that. I don't know. Sometimes people don't get my jokes. But I tell them anyway because I am me. Alright, so I am recording this podcast a little bit later than I had originally intended. Because we had this thing called thunder storms today. And living in the Midwest, you know, it's so rare to have thunder storms that, you know, it's hard for me to pronounce them properly. And, yeah, the uh, weather radio was going off every minute because, you know, ping pong sized hail, 70 mile an hour winds, flooding, you know, life. Um, (laughs) So it was not easy for me to actually find time to get recording done. Then you add to that my cutie little dog that you will probably hear click clack at some point because she likes to click clack. She just loves it. It's her favorite thing. Um, yeah, she needed to be held because she she doesn't like the thunder. So as I am recording this, my husband is in the other room and he is cooking. And some of the sounds, no matter what I do, they bleed through. So, I, I yeah, enjoy that. We're having beef and broccoli tonight. So drool. I'm having a professional chef make me beef and broccoli. I'm very excited. Anywho, so today we are going to be talking about, and please don't hit stop as soon as I say this, because I know some of you are going to be like, I don't know what that is. I don't play that. This is not for me. No, no, no. Today we're going to be talking about the new update for Slime Rancher. Actually, both of them. We're going to be talking about Victor's experimental update, which is amazingly fun, and the secret style pack, which they also released. So, you may not think that this game is for you, especially if you've never played it, but trust me, there is something here to talk about for people of all interests. I I really think you will like this, and just just hold on. But before we get there, if you haven't already, please go and rate this podcast in whatever app you're listening to me on. It really does help out a lot. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we're building up more on um, iTunes. If you can leave a review, that helps out immensely as well. Tells the algorithm to share the podcast with more people. More people, the more community we have. And the more chance I have of doing episodes like I did yesterday. With your beautiful voices on it. And, you know, actually answering your questions. That would be awesome. Okay, so Slime Rancher is a game that I have played way too much. Just, just way too much. Um, I'm currently looking at my Steam. It says I put a 231 hours into this game. And I don't even want to do the math to find out how many days that is. Um, <laughs> I really do love this game. I've played it for quite some time. I've played it through many of its updates. But I d- actually don't want to talk about the gameplay or how much fun it is for weird people like me. Because I I think you have to be a little off in some ways to enjoy the gameplay. Because the game's exactly what it sounds like. You're going to ranch slimes. And they're cute, they're bouncy, they bobble about. But the thing that keeps me in this game is its sense of humor. The thing that keeps me in this game is... Something that I wish more media did, be it a TV show, a movie, or a game. It understands that I am either in its target audience or I'm not in its target audience. 
and it's just going to be its own thing. And that is the brilliance of Slime Rancher. So with this expansion, they did the thing that was, again, something I wish more games would do. So when, if you notice, I said at the beginning that there were two updates that came out at the same time, Victor's Experimental Update and the um, uh, Secret Style Pack. Now, the reason this is awesome and the way gaming should work is secret. the Secret Style Pack is just that. You, you get a mess if once you buy it for, I think it was like $7, seven, $8. You get a message from the seven Z corporation that they have unlocked a way to allow slimes to present in different, you know, colors and whatnot. And I have to say the Ruby ones are gorgeous. The, uh, and the tiger, like this game had me at, Oh, I can turn my tabbies into tigers. Yes, please. But uh, it exploded in orbit on its way to your ranch. And the current cover-up is that they hope that we enjoy the wonderful time finding all of the cases that are now scattered throughout the ranch. And it's cosmetic. It's purely cosmetic. It doesn't change the game at all. You now have the option of, does, your, does this type of slime look like this? Or like that. But you also have the fun of running around and trying to find the little orbs that are, you know, the treasure casks that are hidden throughout the ranch and unlock them. And, you know, it's fun. It's a treasure hunt mixed with some cosmetic stuff. But it really doesn't affect the gameplay. Victor's experimental update is the addition of a new zone. And not only are they adding a new zone, but they are adding a new style of gameplay. This is something that they've done with each of the expansions, be it from Ogden's Retreat to Mitchie Miles's wonderful place that I just love to hang out at. That's where my disco tiggers are. They add these mini games, basically, to the core game that extend the way you can play and the things that you can do there. That was free, if you've purchased the game, of course. Now think about that for a minute. The one that actually extends gameplay makes the game have much more to do in it, and actually adds an entirely new mini game to the game for you to spend your time running around with and doing things. That's free. The cosmetic edition, that costs money. And to me, it seems like this should be such a no-brainer. I already paid for the game. The idea that you would pay make me pay for the additional blessing of playing the game, that, that seems weird and odd to me, and the way most game companies work. And while I, you know, I can understand that, because, you know, if you're doing Civ... You know, new gameplay features are new gameplay features. You're not really going to be giving us skins. Like, do you want old Gandhi or young Gandhi or fasting Gandhi or, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're, that, that's not really a thing that they're going to do for a game like that. At least I hope not. I, I yeah, no, please don't, don't ever do that. That would be bad. So I can understand them, you know, charging for a gameplay expansion. Not as much as they do, but that's a whole other issue for another podcast someday, maybe. But just the idea that I've paid for this game, and so I get to play the game. It's an oddly refreshing experience. It's, it's a strange one. That, oh, new features come out. Well, I guess I'm going to have to dig down in my wallet deep so I can afford to pay to play the game that I've already paid for with its new stuff in it. That just, I don't know. That's always struck me as kind of odd, especially for some of the games that do it, that basically came out kind of broken. 
this was a big problem I felt for Civ Five. Not so much for Civ Six. I thought Civ Six was okay when it came out, but Civ Five, many of the features that you expected to be there in a Civ game weren't there, and of course they were paid add-ons that came about later, and that that felt weird. That felt like they were just trying to milk as much money out of us players as they possibly could, as if they existed on some kind of a capitalist market that incentivized greed over the actual experience of the people that they're harvesting their money from. I don't know. Maybe I'm going too far there. Probably not. But I'm not going to continue on that screen because that's not what I do on the show. But it is a huge problem in the game gaming industry. And to see a company like Monomi Park that have the courage to trust us to continue to play the game and to support them, that that gives me hope. And I think this is something that all of us, whether you're a creative entrepreneur or not, and I really kind of despise that term because while yes, it's important to look at your creative endeavors as a business if you want to make money off of them, once you start looking at them exclusively as a business, you... Uh, oh, this is going to have a lot of uh, charge terms in it, but you, you find a way to alienate yourself from your own production. You find yourself making choices that are more about making money and less about your enjoyment of the process and your audience's enjoyment of the material. I was thinking about this earlier today with comics and how comics do this with their grand overarching event stories and how they brand a lot of comics into the event that really don't have anything to do with the event but they're not selling so well but so maybe if we make you think that you have to read those issues too we can sell a couple more of those <laughs> to you it, it, it's a big problem when you're trying to monetize creativity and this is what's brilliant. And I think one of the things that those of us who write and those of us who draw, those of us who make any kind of creative output, be it a game, videos, movies, podcasts like this one, have to think about is our quirkiness. And this is something that Slime Rancher abounds in. You know, I've been thinking lately about starting a new podcast called keep podcasting weird and trying to find as many weird podcasts that are still going as possible and highlighting them but that's going to be a lot of work and i don't know if i have the time for it but i might make it a feature on this show if i get around to it it's, it's going to be a lot of work because the problem with any industry mainstreaming is the weirdness gets squeezed out of it and that's what's happened with gaming over the last, I would say, 10 years especially, is a lot of the weirdness, a lot of the strangeness that was there in early gaming has completely been ripped out of it for these cookie-cutter titles that really don't have any personality of their own. You know, take the MMO space, right? When I first started playing MMOs, the differences between Ultima Online and EverQuest and Star Wars Galaxies required you to learn entirely new systems for playing these games because they understood that they were different and that they had different personalities. And that made the gaming world amazing. And while I'm not going to blame everything on WoW, even though it's predominantly WoW's fault, Every game that you play now, be it free-to-play or a the rare now AAA game that comes out, for the most part, with very few exceptions, all follow the same cookie-cutter format where you really don't even have to pay attention to the story or to the world because you know it's all the same thing. You're learning how to properly button mash and get your rotation down just right so that you can get your way as fast as you can to the end game content where you're just going to be getting up in groups and doing 
dungeons and raids and whatnot because that's all there is to the game because that's all there is to the game because people who do dungeons and raids are reliable sources of income and that's what we're going to do and you can see this also with other games this is why shooters are so ubiquitous people who like first person shooters are a reliable source of income and I could go on with, you know, this is why 4K games have taken over. And the great thing about them is they still have a lot of quirks to them. Because that hasn't all been beaten out into this is what a perfect game of this type should look like. And I hope we don't get there. But we don't often make room in our lives and on our shelves for games that are as idiosocratic it, it, hmm, that's a hard word to say idiosyncratic as slime rancher which is on its face a very simple game that you kind of discover the story as much as you want to while playing there are little events uh, that are scattered throughout the game that let you know more about the people and the history and the whatnot and you know, you either get invested in Hobson's story, like I did, he's the person you bought the ranch from, and who has disappeared, or you just run around and you play the game as you want to play the game. There's nothing there to force you into the narrative, there's nothing there to force you into the quirky humor that the game has, but it's there for you if you want it. And the game itself is strange and bizarre, and... <laughs> kind of has its own language in and of itself like one of my favorite moments in playing this game ever was i was on a load screen and when you know i just started playing that night and at the bottom they have the little tips you know the gameplay tips that every game has on load screens and it said never turn your back on a chicken and as somebody who just thinks that the chickens in the game are hilarious and my my ranch is swarming with chickens to the point where I don't play it as much when my husband's home because he, he'll just start chanting, oh, the chickens, the chickens, because of all the chicken sounds, because I got chickens everywhere. And then I realized that the chickens will like move four times faster if you turn your back on them than if you don't like they zip around and they do things behind your back. And it's crazy. And it's just this little humorous thing that I hadn't noticed because I hadn't taken the time to notice. And the game decided just to point it out. And it's one of those funny things to try to watch on the periphery as you slowly turn around to see what the chickens are doing. Because the chickens are up to something. They're always up to something. Be paranoid. Be very paranoid. The chickens are trying to get you. Or maybe not. They may just be mad because, you know, I give Bob too many chickens because I find Bob hilarious. But, you know, the f I, I thought about, you know, this topic came up into my mind when I was looking through some of the videos from E3. And, you know, Luigi's Mansion 3 looks interesting. And it looks like it has some weirdness to it. That whole goo Luigi thing, that, that Gooigi, it's going to take time for me to get used to saying Gooigi, but it's bizarre and it's weird and it makes me excited that Nintendo can still do things that are bizarre and interesting because it's in the strange places that innovation happens. It's in the strange experiments that make everything better. You know, if it wasn't for people like me who take the time to write very bizarre fiction, then the genres don't move forward. And whether or not my fiction ever takes off or not, there's a chance that somebody might take the ideas and the imagery that I write in mine and make something amazing. This is something that's happened over and over and over again throughout history. It's the weird oddball experimentation games that make everything magic. Why do you think we're still talking about the first Super Mario Brothers game? It's strange. It's bizarre. You're running around in a world filled with bricks and a guy who can jump and punch the bricks. 
We're going to say punch the bricks because he just put his hand over his head, kind of. And coins that are just floating there and mushroom guys and turtles and all the weirdness that's in that game with the jumping and the bouncing and the bopping and all the way up to, you know, the third one, Super Mario Brothers 3, the Tanuki suit and the frog suit. and There hasn't really been that much innovation in a mario game since then i mean we can talk about the hats and we can talk about you know that it's 3d now and we can talk about all those things but they're not really giving into the strangeness because the strangeness was there at its beginning it was there at its inception and i just want to salute games like slime rancher that one, have the courage to just be weird and bizarre and be what they are and know that they may or may not find an audience and did, in fact, find an audience. And encourage you to go out of your comfort zone from time to time and hunt down weird and bizarre and strange. Not just because you want to sound like one of the chefs on Top Chef who doesn't really know anything about how flavors should actually work but oh isn't this just a strange combination of things but because when you look at somebody who's following their heart and doing something that is just a little bit off that's sometimes where the magic is and victor's experimental update is a lot of fun especially the fact that you have to wait for victor to contact you because that's how the game works. There's a little device that lets you talk to the other ranchers. And you have to wait for Victor to call. And you can only talk to one person per in-game day. And you have to wait for Victor to call. <laughs> so it actually took me a while before I actually got to play in the update. Because I had it. But Victor wasn't calling me. But he finally called. And it's fun. And just little idiosyncrasies like that make the game beautiful and wonderful and things to celebrate. I don't know. You know me. I like celebrating difference. I hope you enjoyed the show and this strange world of Slime Rancher that I've been talking about and some of my thoughts on video games. I've actually been thinking about talking about video games and comics more on the podcast as I've discussed before. I just haven't found a good avenue in. But this was... I don't know, something fun, and I thought you might enjoy it. If you haven't already, please rate this podcast in whatever app you're listening to me on. It really does help out a lot. If you've got a dollar you can throw my way down in the show notes or over in the show notes or near me in the show notes, wherever they are in the app that you're listening to me on, um, you'll find a link to both the pa- my Patreon and the community support page. The difference between them is people on the Patreon occasionally get stuff you can go to the patreon and read about that over there if you're interested but if you've got a buck that really does help out a lot if you can please join the project if you don't have the money please don't stress out about it don't worry about it this isn't that kind of uh, pbs break but if you know anybody that you think would enjoy this podcast do share it with them that helps out immensely as well If you have any questions, comments, or topics you'd like to hear discussed on the show, you can either click the voice message button in, well, text in the show notes, which will allow you to leave me a voice message, no matter what app you're listening to me on. That would be awesome. Or you can hit me up on Twitter or Instagram. I'm C.E. Dorset on both. Um, You can find links to everything that I do over at ProjectShadow.com. And yeah. If you have any tips on how I can use Instagram better, please do, because I really want to get more active over there. Anywho, until next time, don't forget, have the fun. Bye.